Well, happy 80th anniversary. And as it happens, today is also my wedding anniversary, but it's only our 47th, so not really worth um, celebrating. But it's, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you today to speak about the important role meteorologists uh, have to play in realising climate justice. Indeed, since its founding, METAIRN has played a uniquely formative role in Irish society. From a very young age, growing up in County Mayo, I was aware of the weather forecast and its importance in community life. The forecast shapes our island home, it determines when farmers will plant and harvest, it keeps men and women on the seas around our coast safe, and it helps communities plan how and when to come together. Our weather shapes our national identity, and it, its echoes can be found in our art, mythology, and music. Brendan McWilliams understood this intimately, and he often used his column in the Irish Times, Weather Eye, to reflect poignantly on how our climate is interwoven with, into the fabric of our culture. He also foresaw, as many of you did, the spectre of human-induced climate change long before it was a focus of public discourse. In the first February of this millennium, Brendan wrote a column for the Times about the coming of spring. True to his unique talent in science communication, this article drew on lore surrounding St. Bridget's Day, quoted Oliver Goldsmith, and taught readers of the phone effect. Before delivering a stark warning, in his closing paragraph, he said of the arrival of spring, and I quote, since 1940, there has been a dramatic shift the seasons have started to arrive earlier rather than later and at an accelerating rate, as is also detected by the satellites. And this, of course, is entirely consistent with the current greenhouse theories about global warming. In that same year, 2000, when this article was published, I was working as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Climate change wasn't on my list of priorities. It wasn't until several years later when I was working on human rights in African countries, that I came to understand the threat posed by climate change. I'd meet women from agricultural communities in Rwanda, in Liberia, in Malawi, and hear the same stories. The, the seasons are changing, the rains won't come as they used to, we find it very hard to cope. Just as in Ireland, these communities have a special connection to the weather, particularly those depending on the land for their survival. But across Africa, Communities no longer knew when to plant or when to harvest, and these shifting seasons were having disastrous impacts on their food security and resilience. I recall Constance O'Kellett, a farmer from northern Uganda, telling me how she relied on the sale of surplus from their small agricultural yield to pay essentials for her family, education, food, healthcare, clothes. Now the changing climate threatened her family's, family's basic subsistence. And in listening to her and others, a great injustice became clear to me. The impacts of climate change are felt first and hardest by those communities with the least responsibility for the crisis and with the least capacity to respond or adapt. Shortly after these experiences, I set up my foundation focused on climate justice. Climate justice lies at the nexus of climate change and human rights and seeks to focus on what impacts climate change has on the most marginalized and disenfranchised in our global community. The lens of climate justice brings what can, what can be an abstract or obtuse uh, phenomenon into sharp and immediate focus and illuminates the real human face of suffering and devastation brought about by climate change. For me, it embodies both parts of a moral argument to act on climate change. Being on the side of those who are suffering most while also ensuring that they don't suffer further as the world takes action on climate change. The existential threat of climate change confronts us with our global interdependence. In order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change and achieve the ultimate goal of the Paris Agreement, which is to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, the global community must act in solidarity, motivated by enlightened self-interest. And the reason that I'm under some pressure is that I'm actually going 
to Paris just after this for a, another climate summit, two years to the day from the Paris Climate Agreement. But this one is focusing on action and on climate finance. And people are to be held to account during the, the following year, during um, 2018, for what they commit to at this Paris Agreement. And that's the kind of uh, action that we need. The global transformation required to realize climate justice and protect those most vulnerable in the face of climate impacts will require everyone. Meteorolog I can't pronounce that word. Me meteorologists <laughs> will be involved in numerous facets of the fight for climate change and climate justice. But I'd like to touch on three. The first is utilizing your experience to help those living on the front lines of climate change. Your expertise and understanding not just how our climate system is evolving, but also in assisting with developing community resilience in the face of climate impacts will help to save the lives and livelihoods of those worst affected. For instance, as you will all be too well aware, drought is among the most damaging and least understood of all natural hazards. Droughts have become more intense and frequent in recent years because of climate change. When I had my mandate for El Nino and climate in 2016, the onset of a particularly severe El Nino that year, coupled with weakened resilience of communities facing climate impacts, resulted in increased food insecurity for some 60 million people across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. An early warning system is much more than a forecast. It's a linked risk information and communication system that actively engages communities involved in preparedness. Obviously, here in Ireland, the problem will be increased flooding, increased pre precipitation in the coming years. Here we go with that word again. Meteorologists, in conjunction with government <laughs> practitioners, will need to learn how to work with communities in a variety of cultural and social contexts and involve them in conducting risk assessments, dissemination of information, and designing responses. Adopting an inclusive and participatory approach to the design of early warning systems will make them more appropriate, effective, and robust. This brings me to my second point. In some of the poorest and most climate vulnerable countries, weather data is often unreliable or completely lacking. As a result, many don't have the capacity to provide risk information to their own citizens and are unable to manage disaster risk effectively. This inhibits the ability of countries to develop early warning systems and other response measures. Met Aaron and other Met offices across Europe can play an important role in building the capacity of their counterparts in developing countries and help to modernize weather services and data collection. In conjunction with this push to build the capacity of meteorological services in developing countries, efforts must be made to ensure that local and traditional knowledge is preserved, archived, and strengthened to support the fight against climate change. We must learn from the experiences of those who understand the day-to-day -day reality of climate disruption. Local and indigenous, indigenous women's voices, especially, are absent from decision-making on climate change. In many parts of the world, women are responsible for the majority of the labor involved in growing crops and processing food after the harvest. Their collectively held knowledge is critical to successful community-based climate action, and we must find ways to blend local and traditional knowledge with the qualitative and quantitative work of the scientific community. The final point I'd like to make concerns language. While I appreciate that the concepts which underpin weather forecasting and climate change analysis are inherently complex, I know that we must get better at communicating the realities of climate change to the public. People can't engage with scientific knowledge if the concepts being put forward seem impenetrable, and I believe that's something that Brendan McWilliams understood very well. The technical jargon of the climate change community a world of mitigation, adaptation, market mechanisms, and nationally determined contributions is meaningless to most people and only serves to further alienate. The onus is not on communities around the world to learn this obscure language. Instead, we must develop new, inclusive ways of discussing climate change rooted in our cultures and our shared identities. It must speak to the gravity of the situation we find ourselves in and inspire a determination to change course. Before I conclude, a reminder. Climate change is not some future phenomenon we're seeking to stave off. In Ireland, we are fortunate 
while the threat of climate change is real and increasing, it's not yet the imminent and existential threat it is in some parts of the world. For communities living in low-lying Pacific Island atolls like Kiribati and the Marshall Islands, the ebb and flow of the tide can leave them homeless. People like Ursula Rukova, a courageous woman from a small atoll called the Catarit Islands near Papua New Guinea. Faced with rising sea levels, more frequent storms, Ursula has been organizing her people, assisting them in moving from their island atoll to the mainland Papua New Guinea, where they will be safer. But this means leaving their ancestral home behind and taking on the challenge of integrating into a new community and a new way of life. And she says, and there's such sadness in her eyes when she says it, and we have to leave the land of the bones of our ancestors, which is a very tough thing for an indigenous people in particular. There are challenging years ahead for the global community, but if we're to deliver a safe and prosperous world for our children and grandchildren, then we're all called on to join in the struggle for climate justice. For this, we need you to inspire people in Ireland and around the world to take action. Oscar Wilde once said that, and I quote, conversation about the weather is the last refuge of the unimaginative. In the current climate, I couldn't disagree with him more. And now I'll say goodnight to you all 